Hello, overclockers. I'm 8-Pack, the king of overclocking, and the best reason to watch YouTube. Today, I'm gonna to be reviewing the AMD 9900X CPU. And yes, it's over 9,000. What I'm gonna be covering about this CPU is the stock performance versus the previous generation, about thermals of the CPU, so everyone knows what cooler to use, a bit about the power draw, and of course, how to overclock and tune the CPU to get the best out of it, and what results you get from tuning. So, all that being said, let's get into it. So firstly, I need to point out at the time of filming, we didn't have any 9950X in stock. So I couldn't test the, the particular flagship CPU in this range. We did, however, have 9900X CPUs in stock, and that's gonna be the subject of this video. The 9900X is the same architecture as the 9700X, which I tested in a previous video. If you wanna check that out, that's in the description below. The architecture is Granite Ridge Zen 5. It has 12 cores and 24 threads, which is the exact same as the previous generation 7900X. The base clock of this CPU is 4.4 gigahertz with a turbo boost of up to 5.6 gigahertz on one core. But often the one core uh, turbo is reached by several cores, depending on what type of tuning you use. This particular CPU can go in any M5 motherboard with the latest Tegeza code, which will be within a BIOS update. So basically, these CPUs are compatible with any M5 motherboard, providing you update your BIOS. So, what's the memory support on the new 9 series CPUs? The 9900X, when you populate two uh, memory channels, gives you 5600 MHz memory support as stock. If you populate all four DIMM slots, this drops to 3600 MHz. This is a slight improvement on the previous generation, where with the 7900X, with two DIMM population, the memory support was up to 5200 MHz. So if essentially you've got 400 more MHz of official support for memory speed when two DIMMs are populated. When four DIMMs are populated, both generations offer 3600 MHz memory. As well as this improvement in speed or slight improvement in speed, the new platform stroke the new CPUs offer extra memory capacity officially supported with up to 196 gigabytes now officially supported on the new CPU versus 128 gig officially supported on the older generation CPU. I can also say that on the older generation CPU, we here at Overclock has had no problem getting 196 gigabytes working with a bit of tuning in the BIOS. But it's nice to know that AMD have officially now supported that and motherboards will add these 196 gig uh, modules to their QVL lists. In testing, I tested all the way from uh, 5200 MHz memory in dual channel, all the way up to 7600 MHz memory in dual channel, and found that the statistical improvement in performance was negligible, or almost nothing. So this suggests to me that you don't really need to spend extra on memory for, for this particular platform, and you'd probably be better putting the investment into cooling, which we'll discuss a little bit later. This all being said, you can roughly say that memory support hasn't really been uh, improved a lot with this generation of CPUs. You've got a little bit of extra speed on stock, but that could have been reached anyway. No further 4 DIMM support. Uh, and also you've got a little bit of extra capacity, but that capacity was working fine with tuning on the previous gen. All that being said, what was the system I used to test all these different configurations? The motherboard I used was an Asus. X670E Hero board on the latest BIOS with the latest Agisa code supporting this particular CPU generation. Uh, the memory I used for all my testing, having deduced that memory speed didn't really make much difference, was a 5600 MHz Corsair kit uh, with a cast latency uh, standard at uh, 36. The GPU I used was my standard uh, 4090, uh, which is a ROG Strix. And the cooler I used for this particular testing was a 360mm AIO by EK. My OS was on the standard Western Digital 850, uh, SN850X uh, CPU, Windows 11 install with the latest chipset drivers, obviously the latest GPU driver, and anything I could use and update to try to get as much as I could out of the CPU. So updated uh, the Windows as well up to the current levels. So. Let's now talk a little bit about cooling and power draw at completely stock settings when tested against the previous gen CPU. AMD quoted 120 watts uh, TDP for the new CPU and 170 watts for the older CPU, the 7900X. 
I can uh, confirm that under stock uh, maximum testing loads, of which I used the Blender rendering test, I saw 30% less power draw under load on the new generation, which pulled 162 watts, compared to 210 watts uh, on the 7900X. Like I say, that's a 30% drop in power draw. And what this led to effectively was a 35% uh, cooler maximal running temperature, which on this particular CPU, I only saw 69 degrees, which is a very, very good result, versus 93 degrees C on the same cooler using the previous gen CPU, uh, the 7900X. So obviously this reduction in power and reduction in uh, temperatures is brought about by the change of architecture to a much more power efficient design, if you like. Uh, and obviously this leads to being able to, when you're specking your PC, to be able to choose uh, a slightly lower PSU, maybe uh, also choose a slightly lower cooler. Although if you are gonna tune this CPU, I would still suggest a 360 AIO, but for stock, uh, a 240 AIO would certainly be totally fine. And also of course, and I can't believe I'm even saying this, you'd save a few pence on your energy bills if you're bothered about 10 or 15p here and there. So, what were the stock results when comparing the 7900X to the 9900X when running my full range of benchmarks, which include things like Blender, Corona Bench, Cinebench, and so on and so on. It's the standard stuff that you've all seen before and you complain about because I don't do enough game benchmarking. But at the end of the day, I'm a benchmarker. I just want to run synthetics. All right. So what was the improvement generation on generation at totally stock? And when I say stock, I mean, literally go in the BIOS after boot up and just set the DOCP or the XMP of the memory, go into Windows and run the benchmarks. What we saw essentially is generation on generation, averaging out the entire benchmark suite, we saw an 8.8% improvement of the 9900X versus 7900X. If you remove all the GPU bottleneck benchmarks, we saw a 12% improvement on the 9900X versus the 7900X. And obviously, all these results were using less power draw and giving as much less temperature as well to deal with at the cooler end. Now we've gone through the stock results. What were the overclocking and tuning results? Well, for this section, I decided to do the usual when looking at AMD CPUs, which was to do a PBO2 tuning profile and a manual overclocking profile. Now the PBO2 tuning profile I did was I set the motherboard as the limit. Uh, so the power distribution of the motherboard was, was gonna be the limit. Um, I set a negative curve minus 12. Uh, and obviously I set the CPU where possible uh, given temperature to boost 200 megahertz above what you would expect uh, from the normal stock profile. The results of this essentially were not as big as we've seen on other generations of CPU or other, not just generations, but other market sectors, if you like. For example, the previous generation uh, of Ryzen CPUs, you could easily extract 20% extra by doing this kind of thing on your performance benchmarks. Or on Threadripper, you could even extract up to 35 or 40% on a 96 core Threadripper. Here, PBO2 uh, tuning was using an extra 50% of power over stock. It was getting much hotter than stock all the way up to 93 degrees C. And the improvement over my uh, extended benchmarking suite was only 2.4%, as the graphs that are on the screen now will show you. On the overclocking or manual overclocking profile, uh, basically, I set a, an overclock of 5.3 gigahertz, no matter what load was placed on the CPU. My manual overclocking, uh, this also gave quite considerably a lot extra power usage, although less than PBO2, and did give more temperature, although this was well within the acceptable range at mid 80s, uh, again than stock, but also yielded only 1.8% better performance over stock performance. Now, obviously, with both of these, again, just like we did with stock, if you select only cert the certain benchmarks that are CPU uh, limited, you can get a bit more performance. So maybe PBO can give you a maximum of like four to 5%, and maybe uh, standard overclocking or fixed overclocking can give you an improvement of up to 4%, but still not as big a result, like I say, as on the high-end desktop platform or previous generations uh, of Ryzen CPU. So my advice for this would be, if you really want to uh, tune the CPU and get the absolute last few percent out of it, then do PBO2, 
do a manual overclock or combine them both with switcher, which for me was the absolute uh, best idea with this CPU if I wanted to tune it for ultimate performance. The manual overclocking profile basically saw a maximum of 85 degrees C uh, and a power draw of 210 watts. The PBO2 tuning profile gave a maximum temperature of 93C with a maximum power draw of 246 watts. Obviously, these temperatures on the PPO2 tuning, I thought over 90 was a little bit too high for my liking on this particular architecture. So I also tried testing a switcher profile, which I would advise was the best profile overall that I tried because you got the benefits of both types of overclocking, the manual and the PBO2 tuning. This basically meant that you got the PBO2 performance, if you like, but the cooler temperatures when doing multi-core tasks of the manual overclock. So best of both worlds. And for that, I set the switcher to switch between PBO2 and manual at around 90 amps for anyone who wants to copy my settings. So in conclusion, who is this CPU for? Well, this CPU is for your high-end gamers, uh, high-end professional users who are doing Photoshop, rendering, simulation, product design, all these kind of use cases which are great in single core mode and great in multi-core mode. This CPU can satisfy all those segments. It's really a very good generational improvement over the previous generation uh, yielding, if you pick uh, the CPU bottleneck benchmarks, around 12% improvement. At the same time, obviously, you're saving uh, plenty of power, which also translates into lower temperatures. Again, which will obviously prolong the life of the silicon, which is great, but also gives you extra headroom when in terms of choosing your cooling. You can scale down your cooling a bit now if you want to a 240 IO or maybe even an, a good air cooler for this CPU, whereas the previous generation really demanded a 360 uh, AIO or the real elite standard of air cooler. This CPU, of course, is indeed 8-pack approved, and therefore this and the 9950X will be integrated into my range of systems, uh, the 8-pack range, and indeed the Infinite range. So please check out our website for the systems that are using this new series of CPU. And of course, we will also offer these generation of CPUs in our render offerings, which are for a professional user who is going to be looking at doing rendering, simulation, etc. And finally, of course, as always, don't like the video, don't follow my socials, don't subscribe to the channel, but of course do check out my 9700X video. It's the best thing on YouTube right now. All right.